Hello everybody and welcome to today's Business Skills Webinar, Presentation Skills to Make Your Webinar Rock and thank you for bearing with us for that extra minute there while we pay our respects. Um, so thank you everyone for joining, we're very excited for today, um, especially because we're talking about webinars and we all love webinars here at Redback, um, but when it does come to these types of online events, um, it's important to note that our online presenters can make all the difference between something that is enjoyable and memorable and something that may Maybe isn't. So today we're going to uncover the secrets and hopefully provide you guys with some great tips that you can take away and um, put into your webinars and your series for 2015. Now, first of all, I just want to set the scene before we go into the agenda. Um, now, webinars are going to be different for everyone out there and we have been running webinars for a long time here at Redback, but it's important for you guys to note out there that not everything we say is going to be gospel. Um, some of the things you may agree with, some of the things you might not agree with, and it will depend on your industry and also the type of audience and also the type of webinars you're running. So if we do say something that you think, oh, you know, I've got a different view on this, this is something that I might think of a little bit differently, or I've been doing things this way and these seem to work with me for me, please feel free to type this into the chat box because we want to try and build an online community here and help everyone out um, as we go through these six stages on the screen. So. Um, we're going to go into what we spoke about throughout the registration process, the engagement, the presenter requirements, so little tips that you can use as presenters or organisers as well. Um, some of the interactive tools and layout options that are quite unique to the Redback platform and how you can use them to mix up what you're currently doing. Um, creating presentations, this was a big one, so in the registration process so many people told us they wanted to know more about how to create great presentations, how to facilitate, which is going to be my role today, so hopefully I'll do it justice and then also some advanced techniques when it comes to presenting as well. So I want to get into it and introduce our presenter, um, but before we do, just a quick poll and for those of you who haven't used polling, this is a perfect way to see it in action. So think back to the most memorable webinar you attended this year, what made it so memorable for you? So if you can just click on the radio button that corresponds best to your answer. Was it the presenter and their style? Were they amazing? Were they really infectious? Was it the content? Was it great? Um, was it the registration and joining process? Was it seamless and it made it the best webinar ever? Or was it the technology? Maybe the technology was so good and it totally um, just shone, outshone everything else. Um, and we can see these results coming through live and I think that's why today is so important. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Michael now, um, who is our product manager of online events here at Redback. And Michael, as you can see, the majority of people talking about the presenter and their style as making webinars so memorable. So how are you today? I'm very good, Sarah. Thanks for having me today. Um, and what, what's your thoughts on that, just on the presenters being memorable? Um, sorry everyone, I have a bit of a fog in my throat. The presenter is key when it comes to any online forum, any presentation. Your presenter is what makes the presentation. If they're infectious, if they have a big personality, if they can articulate and are believable, that's all the stuff that's going to be really powerful for you when you're uh, participating or watching an online event. <coughs> So yeah, presentation, a presenter is key. How they build their content, how they build their presentation, all of that all plays a role. But yeah, the presenter, having the right presenter will make your event. Great. So um, we've got that covered. Now let's talk about engaging your audience. Um, so just quickly, I just want to make a point um, that it's important for presenters to not only think about when they're online presenting, but to think about how they can engage people right from the moment they register for a webinar. Um, so let's just go into this quite quickly and I want to talk about the registration process and getting people involved in that. What sort of tips, um, what sort of things have we seen, what actually works in terms of engaging people throughout this process, Michael? Well, yeah, the registration process is key and very pivotal for not just the presenter but for the organizer. And this is where the organizer and the presenter kind of need to be working hand in hand to make sure that they're clearly articulating the right message to their audience and they're getting that right engagement. So right now I'm just pulling up an example of what we use as our registration page. And I'll just break it down for everyone. So the biggest thing is your topic. So what is what are we presenting on today? What are people coming here for? There needs to be the topic and the summary, as well as the key takeaways. So what are those key points that you're wanting to be showcasing to everyone who's registering about what they're going to get while joining your event? 
the registration process needs to be really simple. The fields have to be short, concise. You don't want to make it complicated for people to join. And you need to show credibility. And the images that you use, like right here you can't see it, but previously when you guys registered, there was my photo on there as well as Sarah's. And we had links there that went off to my uh, LinkedIn portfolio and I think Sarah's as well. So it shows the credibility in there. But um, Sarah, I know that you've got a lot more information on this because you are a marketing manager here at Redback Conferencing. What are the key takeaways that you see with engaging someone from the registration stage? Yeah, I think what we've seen especially over this year is a lot of people paying a lot more attention to their marketing and getting their presenters involved. So Michael spoke about the credibility factor. So when you are talking about your presenters on these registration pages, having links back to their LinkedIn profiles or their websites and getting everyone to understand a little bit more about them. Um, and also the field. So obviously you need to think of what sort of webinar you are presenting. Um, but So you want the basic details, their first name, their details, their emails. Um, but also get your presenter involved. So I said to Michael before today's webinar, and this is a generic question that we write to most people. Yep. Um, is what are you hoping to learn from today's webinar? What and he, I said to him, okay, what sort of information do you want to know about your audience? He goes, well, I want to know why they're joining. So this is a question we put in there, and then we actually give the information to him afterwards. So then he can actually read that and help tailor the content. And as a presenter, that's incredibly powerful because not only does it allow you to break down the technology barrier when you're online and respond to that and then respond to questions, but it also shows that you actually care um, and also shows that you have actually put some research into it. And if people are going to type in any pre-questions or anything like that, they're more than likely going to want to join on the day. Um, and in terms of joining on the day, let's go into the confirmation email because I know there's been so many times that I've registered for a webinar and I've sat there and I haven't received anything and I don't know what to do and I don't know how to attend. How does this all work and what should people be aware of when organising their confirmation emails? Well, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry again. Key thing is, yeah, when you've got when you're engaging someone before, you need to keep those steps flowing. You need to make sure that once they've gone to your registration page and they filled out those details, they automatically get that uh, confirmation email. This needs to be an auto response. You need to keep them engaged and keep them moving step by step so they know exactly the next moves before getting to your event. So as we've got up here right now, we've got our confirmation email, and this is what all of you guys would have received beforehand. And the things are that this was an auto responder. So as soon as you registered, you should have received this. If people don't receive that auto responder, they start to get a little fretted, like, did they not register correctly? Did I not enter my email address incorrectly? And then they'll try to contact you, the organizer or the support team to ensure that they did. The key things that you need to make sure that you have on your confirmation email is an add to calendar. So the add to calendar is so important because that's what gets the interactivity straight into their calendar. It's going to prompt them on the day of the event that it's going to come up. Um, and you're joining links. So the links to join the webinar your testing link. So every webinar platform is different. None of them are the same. So with R1, we're very lucky that we don't have any downloads for any participants to do. But as a presenter, if you choose to use certain functionality, you might have to download a desktop client to do uh, desktop sharing. So you need to know what you're going to be using and what requirements you need. But from a pre uh, per, uh, participant, there's no downloads or anything. So the testing is just to make sure that their computer that they're using has the capability of doing it. And then you can start to engage with them a little bit more here. You can ask them to submit questions at this stage. So whatever you're wanting to get an answer from, from the presenter on the day, if we had a case study that we're referring to, you can have a link to that there, which would be great. Um, the same thing with supporting documents and the confirm confirming of the why. So confirming of the why is the same dot points that we had on the registration page. It's reiterating that branding. It's showcasing people, yes, this is the reasons why you're joining and the topics that we're going to cover, and they're extremely important. Yeah, and I think this email can sometimes be underestimated and a lot of people just put it together quickly and send it off, um, not realising the impact that it can actually have on the actual webinars. So we've got a lot of clients who actually run panel discussion webinars and their presenters want to let people know what they're going to talk about before the actual webinar happens. So in this confirmation email, and also the reminder email, which we recommend should also be sent on the day of the webinar as well. They will also include a link to a case study. So the whole idea is to take a look at this case study, familiarise yourself with the content that we're going to be talking about. So by the time you do come on the webinar, you've actually got some insight and you've got a vested interest. So you've put all this time into it, so you are going to be more than likely to attend on the day. And even in the Add to Calendar um, links that you actually provide, so when it pops up in the Outlook calendar an hour before or 15 minutes before. You can also have additional links in there as well. So 
I think um, just talking about this before in the engagement before a webinar, just um, the number one tip from us would be to get your presenters involved and ask them how they would like to play a part in this and what they think would probably benefit them more on the day of the webinar and how much they would like to be involved. Um, but any questions on that, please let us know because Michael, what I'm interested now um, is talking about presenter requirements um, and technology is huge and I think no matter how many times you've presented a webinar, you are going to to still be worried about the technology um, and as a presenter, what do we actually need? Um, how do we, what sort of technology do we need to present and what happens if something goes wrong? Just let us all know and let's, uh, let's say it once and for all. Okay. So I'll spell it out quite clearly for you. The first thing is you just have to remember to keep calm. You're working with technology. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are out of your control when it comes to technology, but there's stuff that you can control, and that's what the whole part about technical requirements is. It's really testing, 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 and testing. You want to make sure that you've done dry runs. You know exactly what's going to happen. So technical requirements from the presenter and the facilitator or organizer is the computer you're using. You want to test that you run your webinar off the exact computer that you're going to be using on the day, and also make sure that you download any of the necessary softwares to use that platform on the day. Stable internet. So internet is how you're delivering your message. You need to be able to use this to get your message out there. So you want to make sure that you're not running off of wireless. You want to make sure that you're running off of a fixed internet connection. If you're doing this from your office, you want to make sure that you're doing it at a time when not a lot of people are using the network. Or if you are, send out an email to the whole company saying, I we're presenting a webinar today and you can please internet usage be kept at a low, so no going to sites like YouTube or Vimeo, stuff that's very data heavy that's going to affect your bandwidth. Your webcam, if you choose to use a webcam, you need to ensure that you've tested the webcam and that you're doing your presenting against a wall of a neutral color, something that's not going to cause the camera to fade in and out or adjust. And then you also want to make sure that you talk about the technical requirements with using headphones. So Sarah and I are using VoIP headsets right now, which are amazing to use for deliver over the VoIP that then goes through a reverse hybrid so people can dial in over the phone. But yeah, you want to make sure that you test absolutely everything. And the next ones are the really big ones is a quiet background. We're in a boardroom right now at the very end of our office with a sign about three meters away saying do not enter, keep noise to a minimum, and we have a lot of lighting. Uh, if we were going to be using webcams, we have enough lighting in here to make sure that we're perfectly lit. And then the last thing is branding. So if we had webcams up, we could have a banner behind us. And if we didn't have webcams, we've got our branding in the top right hand corner of the room, which showcases our organization quite well. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, those technical requirements are important, and we can see here, you know, there are no bad audiences, but there are a lot of boring presenters, unfortunately. And I wouldn't, as a presenter, um, I think it's just important for people to know out there that, you know, if you are new to webinars, or maybe you've been doing them for a while, and you're still a little bit hesitant about presenting, is that presenting via webinar is completely different yes. than a live environment. So obviously, you've got technology as a barrier, um, but there are so many other little things that play a role. So what sort of soft skills are needed, Michael? Um, we talk about the importance of being memorable and being enthusiastic, mm -hmm. yep. um, but as a presenter, what are the sort of things that I should be remembering as I go into a webinar and present online and want to make it as memorable as ever? Memorable as ever, that's the key that everyone wants to know. So those big things are you need to have your knowledge. You need to <clears throat> know your content in and out. If you're presenting on a topic, you need to make sure that you're not going to be stumped by a question from someone. You need to make sure that you're credible, you're believable, you're using resources and documents that are going to reinforce your point. You need to have passion about it. I'm very passionate about events. My career started off uh, many years ago actually doing live events such as Fashion Week and World Youth Day, and then my career kind of went on a very strange path through sales, which led me to products, which which led me to digital events, but I'm still doing in an industry that I love and I found this passion in technology where you can reach people. So you need to have that passion to show that you're infectious about it so you're believable and you need to be off the cuff. You can't be so rigid with your content. And I know there's a lot of presenters out there who have very dry content and you can't really get away from that, but you need to be passionate about that and be able to be not so rigid that you're just reading a script. You need to have a facilitator is great for this. Having Sarah here, we feed off each other. She can interrupt me with a question or, or interact with a chat box while I'm presenting, and that will break up my presentation. And the same thing with taking questions throughout. You don't need to be 100% structured. I recommend to a lot of people that they should probably take questions every 15 minutes throughout just so they're answering the questions as they're coming through. Camera training is really key. Having a webcam on offers a lot of 
engagement with your audience, but as a presenter, it's quite daunting. You are looking at yourself through the entire presentation. Sarah and I have chosen not to use our camera today, not for the fact that we have bad hair days, but because we just chosen not to. Um, and then you want to make sure if you're presenting to a camera, you have soft eyes. You're talking to, almost you're talking to a friend. You have to keep gestures at a minimum because if you have very enthusiastic presenters who flash their arms out, they go off camera and it kind of gets distracting. They need to be platform ready. They need to be trained on the platform. And this kind of takes a couple of times. So we always talk, we work with our presenters and do a full hour presentation skills, making sure that they know where all the tools are. And also the facilitator gets trained up on that as well so that they know so that they can take over in case a presenter um, hasn't used an annotation tool or anything. And then again, the biggest thing out of all is rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You want to know your slides are coming up next. You want to know what's happening next. You want to be prepared and um, yeah, just take it one step at a time. Yeah, and I think that's really important when you talk about the um, the format, Michael, and having Q&A sessions and stuff like that. So right now we don't have any questions coming through, um, but we are keeping this quite casual, so I just wanted to let you guys out there know exactly what we're doing. Um, we have an over to slide up here now, so it's, you know, we've rehearsed this and we know about 15 minutes in, if we have any questions, we're going to pop a slide up that will actually ask people for questions. So then we're not only prompting ourselves, um, as a facilitator, and Michael can tell you this himself, as he gets into the momentum of a PowerPoint, he might forget to ask questions or he might just keep going and not really pay too much attention to that Q&A box. So having these little interruption slides is a great way for you and your facilitator, if you have one, to just remind you that there are Q&A sessions and to keep it interactive. Um, at the moment, we don't have any, so if you do have any, please type them in. Um, and we are going to move along to the next section now, which is tools. And I think the biggest thing here, Michael, is there are so many tools yes. available to people and it's almost like an overload within a webinar environment. Um, and I think if we can just show people exactly what's available to them, and then I think it's a sort of scenario where we see so many people just use two or three tools throughout yep. a webinar. Um, if it's more of a collaborative environment, then they are going to use more. But can we just take a look at the tools that are available on the Redback platform in particular? And this is just showing our platform, guys. So if you are using something else, um, then you know it might be a little bit different. But can we just go through some of the yep. tools that we frequently use within a webinar environment? Perfect. No, I'd love to. So I'm going to pull up now just a screenshot of what you guys are looking at right now with little highlights to absolutely everything that you can use. Now, as Sarah said, when you're presenting, you're not going to use 50% or even 75% of these because when you're choosing to present on a webinar, you need to know your content and know the functionality that you want to use. So as you saw before, we use polls before and we're going to use polls again throughout this because we really like that functionality and it gets people engaging, it gets people using it. And so our, to our polling functionality is done down here in the tools section. You can also do different things like having closed caption and a Q&A manager. So the Q&A manager allows the facilitator to see all the questions coming up and then choose when to do those. And it's just a note um, as well there, Michael, so we, we actually um, pre-populate polls and everything beforehand, so you have the ability to do that, don't you? Yes, you do. You have the ability to pre-populate polls, have them all saved there so that when you get to them, you can automatically launch them, but also with being off the cuff, you can create a poll on the fly and choose your answers and add them to it. So you'll get a lot of really enthusiastic presenters who will be like, and I've had this happen a couple of times, who halfway through is like, oh, you know what, I want to find out how people are engaging with me and he'll launch a quick poll that he's made up himself. So while we're on this right now, I'll just go through the different functionalities. So we'll start from left to right. So participant list. Right now, we've got a participant list where we can see everyone's names in there. We can see how many people are online. But the participant list can be used a couple of different ways. In this example, we've got a webcam showing here. So normally, we have a webcam on the left hand, right hand side of the screen. But for this, you can have it in the participant list if you want to have your slides maximized out. We then have the chat box below that. The chat box allows you to have people interacting, asking their questions, also putting you through technical problems that they might be having. And then this is the view of what I'm looking at right now. So you guys will see it slightly differently because you'll have just the slide up, but as a presenter, I have all of my thumbnails so I can see exactly what's coming up next in my slideshow. And then below it, if I did have a, if I had any notes, they would be showing up here. So instead of having my paperwork in front of me and rustling around, I can keep all of my notes down below the PowerPoint. And that's saved from when you're building your PowerPoint presentation. If you add the notes there, that carries through into our platform. Now, that's not the same with all of them, but that's what our platform does. Now, at the top here, we have different thumbnails. Well, not thumbnails, little tabs. And this is the different interactivity. So we have desktop sharing. Oops, sorry, I just clicked on the slide and moved forward. Desktop sharing. 
slideshow, a whiteboard. So as Sarah mentioned before, those collaboration sessions where you're trying to get people's feedback, you can make them presenters and people can type to you. Video players, so if you did want to showcase a video, which we'll do a little later on, you can have those all preloaded in the platform so you're not having to go search for them. And then notes where you're trying to, when you can type up notes as well. Now, as I said before, your functionality that you guys are going to use as presenters depends on your presentation and what you choose to use and when. And it all depends on what you're trying to achieve at the end. And we'll get down to this a little later on, but you don't have to use everything because it's there. Never think because you have functionality, you need to use it. You need to think about what you're trying to achieve with your end user or who you're targeting and build your presentation around that. Mm. Um. Yeah, that's a good point, Michael. Um, what I want to do, um, I'm just going to launch another poll as we go into the next section to answer some questions that are coming through at the moment um, because I really just want to start talking about the presentations. Um, but before we go into that, here's a, here's a poll. So do you think your PowerPoint slides are effective? So if you can just answer. But just on what we were just talking about then, the actual platform, um, Joanne, and I think this is a great point. So. Some attendees ask very long technical questions and they suggest they want personal advice as opposed to the presenter speaking to everyone. Um, and she tries to state that the questions need to be shorter in general as it can be harder to monitor the questions. Um, and I would just like to add just from a facilitator point of view, um, I think first of all, if you are talking about technical questions about the actual platform, then um, it's really important that you have your testing links on your reminder emails as well. Um, but also, I I think as a facilitator, it's if you don't have a facilitator, it's probably important to get a facilitator. And what we do with questions that come through that are quite long, every question we copy and paste to a Word document so we've got it all sorted. Um, it can be quite difficult to monitor all these questions coming through in a little box down the left-hand side. Um, but if you are a facilitator, this box can actually be changed. So we can actually change the layout. Um, yeah, we can actually change the layout so that um, as a facilitator I can only see a huge box with the questions coming in. But it's important to also tell people, you know, we might not be able to answer all the questions that come through today. So what we will do after the event, we're going to download a transcript because all these questions are available on an exportable transcript and we're going to respond to those and we're going to send that out within 48 hours along with the recording of the actual webinar. So little things like that can help people. Um, but you are always going to get those people that are going to ask lengthy questions. Um, and also the ideal length of time for a webinar, um, that can be a little bit difficult, <laughs> um, Shannon. Um, but what we do for ours, I think if you are doing professional development, so where people actually get rewarded points, um, then they can go as long as you like. So if you do, if you are rewarding more points based on a certain topic, then they may be a little bit longer. But what we find the average webinar is around the hour mark. So you've got 45 minutes for Q&A, and then you also have 50, sorry, 45 minutes for the presentation and then 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, but, you know, depending, sometimes the hours only go for half an hour to 45 minutes if it is a topic that we can condense. Um, what I would recommend is that you survey your audience, Shannon. So after conducting your first webinar, in the survey that you're asking people afterwards, ask them, was this length of time good for you? Um, would you prefer shorter? Would you prefer longer? And you'll be able to tell your audience online so we can see how many people are online. And if you start seeing people drop off after 20 minutes, it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe this isn't the right time of day for them and maybe this isn't the right type of content that they want to hear at this hour or maybe there's too much information. Um, so the more interaction that you can have with your audience before and after is great. Um, and back to this poll, <laughs> PowerPoint slides, um, and I sort of under, I sort of knew that this was going to be the response yep. that we would get. Um, I think everyone looks to improve their PowerPoint slides, whether or not they're online or whether or not they're face to face. Um, so. We can see here 40% of people saying that they think they are great, which is good. Um, but hopefully, you guys too can really get some um, some you know tips and tricks yep. that you can do to improve them. So let's go into creating um, presentations, Michael, because this is a fun bit. Yep. Um, and like I said earlier, it is going to be really industry specific, especially with branding. And I know some of our webinar clients are really restricted in terms of the PowerPoint slides they create, but there are a few little things you can do here and there just to make it um, a bit more appealing to your virtual audience. So let's start with um, webinar considerations. So you mentioned before we need to upload the presentation into the webinar. So what do we need to consider when creating our presentation? I know that we have to use PowerPoint, correct? Yes. So for our platform and for I think every platform out there, um, 
Kino and Prezi do not play well with them, unfortunately. They are great tools, but for what we're doing and for webinars, you need to do them in PowerPoint. Um, and also, you need to be aware of the platform restrictions that you may have. So with our platform, there are no restrictions with PowerPoint. It carries all the notes. It carries all the animations, which is great. But it's not like a live event. What you need to remember is that when you're doing an online event, you kind of have to have introduction slides. You have to have your opening slide talking about housekeeping rules. You also need to talk about slides. So every time that we are introduced, not slides, uh, polling, every time we're launching a poll, we have a poll slide. Same thing with questions. We have questions informing people about the topic or the discussion that we're going to be doing. So you really want to make sure you have those. You want to also build your presentation so the annotation tools work really well. So right now I'm using a laser dot pointer so I can talk about what I'm going to be using or the points that I'm doing it for. And on-demand content. So your slides need to be able to translate post-event when you're putting this in the reminder email, which we didn't cover off at the beginning, but in the reminder email, you want to have a link to download the slides. So you want to, or yes, at the very end, but not the reminder, the follow-up email. My apologies. So the follow-up email have a link to download your slides. So if someone didn't actually watch your presentation and they get your slides, they'll still be able to get the information from it. You'd, there's a lot of people out there that do the whole one thought slide image, which is great, but that doesn't really translate if you go back through and you haven't listened to the presenter. And then test all the animations and fonts. So our animations carry through, but a lot of marketing uh, people out there now use custom fonts, and if they're not in the platform, when you upload your uh, slideshow, it's not going to render correctly. It's, the fonts aren't going to keep, so you want to make sure you use generic fonts that are going to carry through to the platform and always upload them prior to and test. And as I keep saying upload them, our slides live in a library. So they get converted when they get uploaded. So it's not like a live event where you walk up to the podium with a USB plug in and go. They need to be uploaded. And if you have really high res images and everything, it can take 10, 15 minutes, depending on the size of the presentation. So you want to make sure you upload this at least a day before, test it, rehearse it, all of those things. Cool. And also, I just thought that, Brad, so it sounds like you should not pack too much information into your webinar. You don't want to. Like, the, the slides that you're presenting to should carry off the dot points, as I referred to, but then you should be speaking about those dot points, not to those dot points. So I'll just go over to the next one now. So, designing considerations. So, this is very key when you're building your presentation. You want to use large fonts. You want to use high-quality images. You want to uh, refrain from blocks of text. This isn't, you're not presenting case studies or anything, you're giving those to people so that they can read them in their own time. Your slides need to be key information that's con uh, consistent with what you're delivering, but not the information itself. You're listening to the presenter and what they're talking about, not just reading the slides. Keeping it consistent and branding, so throughout this whole entire presentation, we've had a green theme. Green is one of our colors that we use. We've had the same background image. We're keeping it very consistent. And then you want to consider animations. So animations, again, are a powerful tool. On this platform they use, you need to test on other ones if those animations carry through. Okay, and I think um, for a lot of people out there who have been designing PowerPoints for a while, it can, um, you know, they've heard this before, but I just want to go through some examples of before and after and how they do translate a little bit differently on the webinar platform and then also um, give you guys some um, links as well that you can use. Um, I'm going to get you to turn your laser off too, Michael, oh, because sorry. it's actually starting to frustrate me. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, tip number one, your facilitator is always the boss, so just remember that, guys. Yes. Um, so let's look at this slide. So this looks quite clean, quite... Um, you know, it's got three bullet points on there. It's talking about information. It looks quite nice on the screen. Um, can it be improved? Things can always be improved. As you said, this isn't a bad slide. It consistently goes with what I just said before, but you can always take slides to the next level, and you just have to think about them a little bit differently. So here was the before. Let's have a look at the after. So we have the exact same messages, but instead of using dot points, we've used those key facts from the previous slide to be those relevant points. We've made it larger. We've made it more bold. It stands out more, and it still carries the same message, saying, like, 50% of our brain is wired for visuals. That's such a key message because visuals automatically translate. By looking at the other slide, I wanted to read each I had to read each one um, quite clearly. Here I can see, okay, 60K, uh, 50%, 30X. I know the percentages and the stats for each one of those dot points straight away. It's a very powerful tool when you're using visuals that way. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go over to another example. So again, this isn't a bad slide. Drive revenue through new channels. It's got a stock standard image on it. It's got a clean backdrop, but the dot points are quite small. It's not a lot of text on the page, so it is still a good slide, but it can be improved. So let's go to the after. 
So using different style of images to carry off that exact same information, but we've added depth to this page. So we've got a much bigger title on there. We've kept the blues all consistent for all those different symbols. So it's kind of like using the apps. Like our brains are wired for looking at apps now and relating that to information. So we can see the mobile, the web, the tablet, e-commerce, and having an image behind that that gives that page a bit of depth gets rid of that flat image, that stagnant presentation. And these images, so I know, Sarah, you've got links for these images, correct? Yeah, I'm just going to send, I just put a link in the chat box. So flaticon.com is a site that we use and this gives you free vector icons. So you literally click on it, you go and search. So if you search computer in the search bar and then you click on search, it'll give you a list of thousand free icons that you can use and you just save them and you can use them on your PowerPoint presentations. And I, I think that you're right, Michael, people are so wired with this whole mobile device generation, these icons and these little pretty pictures. You know, stock images like we saw in the previous example there, they're great um, and you know if you search you can find them anywhere but I think these sort of little tiny icons they resonate with people more and I think if you are presenting on behalf of another organization and you need to use their branding it's going to be a lot easier to use these icons in a PowerPoint presentation and get that approved than someone's face holding a mobile phone yes. for example um, and with a lot of these what we do so uh, like we said earlier, we want to make this like grey and green, so we download the images from Flat Icon, and then we just put them into a PowerPoint, and then we just change the background colour so they turn green. So a lot of things that you can do with images just to really enhance it a little bit, um, and instead of using dot points, just use little icons, and it makes such a big difference. It does. That's brilliant to do. So, brilliant. Brilliant. So we'll go for another example. Another before. So here we've got a lot of them over text. They've bolded one section, a sentence, which is have a strong online presence is key. Um, and then we've got an image of music in the world, which is trying to tie in that one line. But that's a busy slide. Like it's not a bad slide, but it's busy. And you're trying to read the whole thing. And having that one cent or that half a sentence in bold isn't as strong as what you could potentially do, which is this. So just taking that one sentence out, having a strong online presence is key. That's all that that slide was previously saying, but they had a lot of stuff around it which didn't need to be there. Right. You don't need to clutter your slides. You don't, if you want to just make one part uh, the key and the focus, remove everything else. You don't need to have it. It wasn't adding any value to it. So yeah, if you want to keep your slides simple, make them strong, make them bold, and speak to those slides. Okay, let's talk more about what the presentation will actually look like in the platform. So we've created our presentation, we've got all these great tips, we've used some flashy icons, now we've uploaded it into the system. As a presenter, will I see something different as to someone else joining the webinar? And what are the advantages and disadvantages and what, what can I use? Okay, perfect. So yeah, exactly as Sarah just said, we see things differently as a presenter than the audience does. So as you guys are at home or at the work, you're not seeing exactly what I am. So this screenshot right here is showing exactly what I'm seeing right now, kind of. It's a different presentation, but kind of. But I'll go through it. So we have slide thumbnails here. So everything that I'm about to be moving forward to, I can see the next slide coming up. I can also see all my notes that carry through in the PowerPoint presentation that I typed in there underneath my slide. So I'm not having to look down. And this is really key if you're using webcams. Because with webcams, if you're looking down at a piece of paper, you drop your head. If you're still looking at the page, you're just dropping your eyes, so you're still having connection with that camera, so it's a very useful tool. And then here we can see we still have the slide, it's taking up the whole screen, we know exactly what we're presenting to. But then we're also choosing the different areas at the top here, which is the what functionality. So right now I'm on slideshow, and then if I wanted to, I could be switching over to video player or anything. But yeah, as a presenter, you see things differently, and you always will. But um, the pre your audience will always have the same experience. But then it's just you want to tailor your view exactly to your presentation and what you're comfortable with. So presentation platform, a couple different ways you can set up your room because you can customize a lot on all platforms. I think a lot of people don't know this, do they? They can actually customize the layout so they can have the chat box um, along the bottom of the screen as opposed to the left of the screen. They can change it up. They can change the color of the yep. background as well. Um, so a few different funky things that you can do uh, maybe to just even surprise people next year when they log on to your webinar. Surprise! Surprise! Yeah. 
Exactly. No, and you can. Exactly what Sarah says. Play around with the platform. Make it your own. You can customize it. They don't always have to be the same. Um, your PowerPoint styling, you can make that 4 by 3 or 16 by 9 Right now, we've done a 4 by 3 because in standard practices, we would have webcams up on the right-hand side of the screen in another panel, which would fit that presentation in quite perfectly in Square and get rid of these pillar lines. If we wanted to and not have a camera, we can make this 16 by 9 and it would fill the whole space, which would be great uh, for having more content on there. Q&A display, as Sarah just said, the chat box doesn't have to be on the left-hand side. We prefer it to be, but it can go across the whole bottom length of the page underneath the slides, which is quite good when you have a lot of people writing really lengthy questions because it would read all in one sentence. And then the attendee views, you can choose what they see. So you can full screen the page, you can remove participant chat, you can remove the chat box, you can make it so they just see the slides and absolutely nothing else. And then format. So your format is how you're building your presentation around the platform. So that would be everything from having the slides at the beginning showcasing, having the uh, the slides for 16 by 9 or 4 by 3. So you can play around with this a lot, but that's the whole thing is you want to get in your platform, you want to play around with it, and everything can be done by using, in the very top right-hand corner next to the blue X is a little cogwheel, and that's a settings button, and as a moderator or a facilitator, when you log in, you can play around with all the controls, and it's just a lot of fun to play around and test out and see what's going to work best for you. And in saying this, I know that we had questions coming in before about people wanting to know that, uh, if they should do just hybrid events from a physical event to digital and then also do just digital only. Using these settings, you can change your room around quite a lot so that you can carry off a hybrid event on this platform quite easily. You can take the video camera and you can undock it and make it a lot larger. So if you do have someone presenting at a lectern, you can have a much bigger video player docked on the page for everyone, say in the bottom right-hand corner, and then you build your slides so that they're around the video so that you can still do that. Can you just um, explain for some people out there what a hybrid event is and how that would work in this environment? Because yep. I think it's quite useful. Yeah, so a hybrid event is a live or physical event that you're doing that you're wanting to then do online at the same time. So you're already taking your physical event that you're having and they're using technology equipment like a webinar to go beyond those four walls and bring people in that couldn't attend it physically. So with that, what it would be is conferences, uh, not AGMs, but um, we do a lot of, I'm trying to think what they are, but they're like small training groups, workshops, people of 30 people in a room, presenters standing at a lectern, and then we'd have them at their laptop, they would upload their slide presentations into this platform, so the people online would get the exact same experience as the people in the room, and then they'd have video cameras as well so they could see it. So there's a couple different ways of doing it, and I'm happy for anyone who wants to talk in more detail about that to contact me afterwards, my details will be going out. And I can help you guys with consulting on how you can take your physical event and make it into a hybrid event. Mm. And what I've also done, Michael, I've just put a link in the chat box to our um, tutorials. So for those of you who are using Redback at the moment, um, if you do want to customize your layout, there's literally step-by-step 30-second -step videos on how to do that within those tutorials, also on how to do anything. Um, and I just want to quickly jump to something because someone did ask this in the registration process about showing video. So as a presenter, and I haven't pre-planned this at all, um, <laughs> As a facilitator, um, I just simply click on video player, which is this tab here, which I'm going to do now. And then I'm going to actually, I can search YouTube, so I can stream from YouTube. And because Redback has a YouTube channel, I just search Redback conferencing. And what I can then do is actually play the video straight from in here. So if you can't hear, you will actually need to... So I don't want to play it for too long because otherwise the sound's going to you know, talk on top of us and whatnot, but that's just an example on how easy it is to actually stream a video. And I think a video is a great way to mix things up, to break the ice, um, to sort of add some sort of depth into your presentation as a presenter as well. And you know, as a presenter, you won't need to worry about the technology or anything like that because your facilitator's role is to do that. So I think you know, what we've done for today, we've organized the presentation, then we've sat down with literally a Word document, step by step, what comes next. And then, as a facilitator, I will then know when to actually play the video for Michael. And then all I have to do is switch back in. Easy. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. So yeah, you can, as Sarah's mentioned, like the facilitator works with you as a presenter. So you really want to have a great relationship there. But you also want to make sure that you can practice, you know each other's cues, you know what's going to be coming up. So it's all very important. Mm. So let's move on now to the next slide, So, which is over to you. So any questions? 
And Shannon does have a question. So is there a platform that makes it possible to participate in webinars via smartphone? So I'm assuming any mobile device then, Michael? Yes. So our platform is goes across any device. So you can log on to this and view the slide presentation and the uh, interactivity. Everything comes up on it. The iPhone, I think, only shows the presentation. But I think if you're doing it off the tablets and everything, you do get the webcams and other functionality comes up on it, but I'm going to have to double check that one. But yes, our platform and most other platforms are fully integrated with smart devices these days. In saying that you would have to download a local app, all of them have that for it, but you want to just check that out first and make sure that it does that. Um, and a question from Megan. So what about copyright uh, when using YouTube clips in a commercial presentation? So the good thing about YouTube is that it's already, it's a publicly listed and uploaded content. So by doing the, having that content up there and utilizing it, you're not breaking any copyright laws. Copyright laws. Mm -hmm. because the person who uploaded it potentially is breaking it if they haven't found it yet, but by you repurposing it, you're not going to get in any trouble for that. Mm -hmm. um, and saying that with our platform, you don't have to just stream from YouTube. You can upload any video file to it. You just do it exactly the same as you would do with a slideshow presentation. You just click on video players, start video, and there's a little button there saying upload video, and it uploads it for you. Mm. Now, I want to go into flawless facilitation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, well, hopefully it does make sense, the fact that I'm the facilitator, so hopefully it has been flawless. Um, but Michael, I just want to hand over to you. So as a presenter, and you're probably the best person to ask right now, what is the biggest advantage of having a facilitator online with you at the same time? The biggest advantage is because we pointed at the beginning, you have technology as a barrier for you. So as you're presenting, you get hardly feedback from the audience. You can't judge a reaction by their facial expressions or the noise in the room. But having Sarah across from me, she has a lot of hand signals that you guys don't see. When I start to speak too fast, her hand comes up. She gives me feedback about my pace. Um, she, I have someone in the room with me. So you're not doing this by yourself. You have someone to share the load. And she takes a lot of the technical stuff away from me. It's absolutely I think it's the best thing you can do for yourself is to have a facilitator on any webinar because if not, if you're doing this by yourself, it can be a little daunting. You have to have many arms, many hands. You have to be doing everything at once. Having someone there with you just makes the workload so much easier. I just wanted you to flatter me. I really did not have any other point to that question, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so as we go into flawless facilitation now, um, I just want to talk about three main stages um, and the facilitator's role through these stages. So, And like I said, this is going to be different um, depending on the type of webinar you are hosting and also depending on your audience as well. So um, if your audience is um, a little bit more, um, I don't know, smaller or larger, so it's maybe a little bit more collaborative as opposed to one way, it is going to differ. But um, typically there are three main stages of facilitator and their role. So before the webinar, so before we actually get into the, the nuts and bolts of the webinar, the facilitator's role, as you saw earlier, is to open the presentation to do the housekeeping rules, to let people know how to interact, to also provide an introduction and maybe a brief bio, and then to also set the scene for everyone involved. Um, and I just really want to uh, mention something here, and I think um, it is quite important, especially um, myself being a participant on many webinars, is to keep it short. Um, obviously, you want to create some interaction with people online, but I think having it as brief as possible. I have attended so many webinars, and if anyone can raise their hand to agree with me, where I'll hop online and the facilitator or the host talks about the presenter and all their accolades and all the certificates for about 10 minutes. And I'm just, oh, well, I know who I've actually joined the webinar to see because I was part of it through the registration process. And if I was really interested in the host um, or the presenter, I had then gone to check out their links and whatnot. But as someone, you know, giving up an hour, 45 minutes, an hour of my time, I want you to get straight into it and I want to learn something. So. They're my top tips for the before. The during section. Um, so obviously to host the Q&A that comes through and like I mentioned earlier, if there are technical questions coming through, usually I can actually open up private chat with people here. So I'm just going to surprise someone here and this will be testing if they're listening or not. So I've just opened up um, a private chat with someone. Alex actually, so let's see. And Alex will actually get a flashing light within the actual chat box then. So we can chat privately. So if Alex is having any issues um, within the system, with his sound or something like that, I can actually chat to him privately so everyone else doesn't have to be part of it. 
Um, also, to prompt the presenter, like we said earlier, um, interview style is great. I think, especially if you've got webcams or you've got more than one. Um, if you've got more than one presenter definitely go for a facilitator and have them interview them. And make sure they do have some sort of knowledge on the topic. Um, you can hire facilitators out there, but if they do have knowledge on the topic, it's just going to come through a lot more seamless. Like I said, the technical issues, the tools, if I need to create video, um, time management, so I can say, oh God, you know, run out of time, let's skip a few slides, or let's do this, and sort of work with the presenter. Um, and canned questions, so you know, what if we don't get any questions? How awkward is that going to be online when we're going to a question session? And no one's asking us questions. So having those canned questions and making them seem as real as possible is obviously a good way to present. Um, but I think the biggest thing here with the during section is to make sure that you and your presenter are working well together and that you have it all organised. Um, otherwise, it's just going to pretty much blow up um, and people will actually get that sense online, I feel. And then the last bit as well is also the close, which we're going to go to very shortly, um, is final questions. So any sort of final question, questions, wrapping it up, but then letting people to know where to go to next. There's nothing worse than being on a webinar, say half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and then they just close it. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, that's it. There's no sort of follow-up. There's no call to action. And if you're doing something for educational purposes, you know, where can people find out more? What if people have questions after the webinar? What are they going to do? Also, for lead generation purposes, if you're doing this for sales um, reasons, also, you know, what are we going to do? What, what do you want people to do after that? And then also close the webinar as well. So that's um, essentially what the role of a presenter, um, a facilitator is. But like I said, it's really, really crucial that you work hand in hand with your presenter. Um, and I can see a few questions coming through, but being the timekeeper that I am, I'm just going to move on quickly to storytelling and framing before we go to those questions. So Michael, I know that you like a good yarn, but let's go into storytelling and what that is and how it all works. Okay, so storytelling is, taking your presenter's content to the next level. So a lot of people, a lot of presenters out there um, will build content that is extremely dry and that's because of the topic that you have to talk about. So you need to be able to make it relatable and relatable to the audience and you need to take that presenter's stuff to the next level. And by doing that, it's kind of by humanizing yourself and pulling yourself into the content. So I'm gonna do my best at drawing an example of this. And the very first time I presented with Sarah, and this is going back a couple of years. We weren't doing a webinar, we were doing a webcast. And I was extremely nervous. I didn't, it was a broadcast quality HD camera feed and I didn't want to participate in the live event. So being the technical person that I am, I was like, I know, I'll pull the wool over people's eyes and we'll do pre-recorded content. And so Sarah and I, we sat down on the couches. She interviewed me for about 45 minutes. I then took the file, I encoded it, and I made it possibly too high. And then when the event went live, I started streaming it at a very, very high bit rate because I don't know why, but I did. And then all of our audience that were out there didn't have the internet bandwidth to see it, so it started buffering terribly. And so within the first two minutes, people were chatting, can't see it, can't see it, can't see it. So I've had a mic, Sarah and myself up very quickly, jump on the couch, and we had a cut from recorded content to live content. Thank God we were wearing the same clothes. And then had to inform everyone that I was very nervous about doing this today, so I tried to pull the wool over their eyes and do pre-recorded content. But as they say, the show must go on, and we'll go into the live presentation now. And the good thing about that was instantly people kind of felt bad for us, so they listened to us and they wanted to see how it would go. But the feedback we got was amazing. They were like, you guys showed us what true presenters have to do. They have to get on with the show. You handled it very well. We did the Q&A and we got great feedback. And it turned out to be a very good experience. But yeah, talk, the first few minutes I was pulling my hair up. But as we say, the show must go on. And by telling people, you guys, the story, it's showing you that I know where you guys are coming from at the beginning and you might want to take uh, shortcuts, but you need to jump in there prepare, make yourself relaxed and be able to use content that is relatable to, and so people can relate to you. But not only that, the content and the stories you talk about need to illustrate and reinforce learning. So by me doing that back then, I never did it again, but I also did it so that I would always test my equipment. I would always make sure that I knew the stuff that I was talking about and I wouldn't let my nerves get the best of me. 
And then the next way of using the storytelling method and everything is trying to use metaphors. Now, using metaphors to make it memorable, and I'm going to pass back to my facilitator because she's got quite a good one for this. Yeah, we actually, um, a webinar I attended not that long ago, and it was, it was a marketing webinar, and it was on lead generation and nurturing. So many of you might be familiar with the lead nurturing concept um, and taking people through a journey in a sales cycle. And one of the greatest metaphors that resonated with me was these guys were talking about their product and they were talking about all the nurturing tools that they can do with it and whatnot. And I'm like, well, I still don't get it. I still don't know what you're talking about. And then he started comparing his product to a relationship. So he started talking about the fact that when you first meet someone, you ask them to go on a date, you don't just get down on one knee and marry them within 20 minutes. Um, so you need to take them out, you go on a date, you take them for dinner, you woo them, you wine them, you dine them and it's such a journey and he compared that to the journey of um, a sales cycle and the fact that that is exactly what their product does and that's exactly how their product can help you. And being a webinar attendee and having that light bulb moment for me was so powerful and I think just a simple metaphor like that from a presenter is excellent. If you can try and, like Michael said, humanise your content and make it relatable for people, it's going to make the world of difference and going back to his example of us on that webcast which was a great day as you can all imagine. I think for us, getting online and the best thing Michael could do was tell the story to people and say, you know what guys, we tried to do something but it actually stuffed up and it didn't work and I think that puts people at ease because it also makes them realise that you aren't just this talking head behind a computer in webinar land, you're actually a real person and they can actually learn a thing or two from you. Um, so just a few tips there with storytelling. Um, now. The next thing I want to talk about, um, and you know, I get this feeling quite often in my life, but um, is your audience just not that into you? Um, and this goes into framing, and we've got a whole webinar presenter center um, blog of videos that we can send you the links to after this. Um, but for me, I think framing is really important and I think it's something that has to be told from the beginning and I'm going to explain that now because sometimes as a presenter, you don't have that instantaneous feedback from people. Um, Michael and I have feedback from one another, as we mentioned earlier, but I can't actually see my audience rolling their eyes or walking out or checking their emails. So for me, you know, sometimes you can sense it and if you're a presenter and you see people drop off, then it's probably one of the worst feelings in the world. But if you can try and frame it for people out there, I think it makes the world of difference. And I don't know if you guys remember, but at the beginning of the webinar today, I actually set the scene for everyone and I told you guys that you know we are doing this on webinar presenting today and we have been doing this for a long time however it isn't gospel we understand that everyone is different but here are our tips and here's some information that we're giving you guys you might take one or two things away from it or you might take a lot from it but at least I'm setting the scene and I'm not coming online and pretending to be the expert and the you know, the person who knows everything because really no one is. So I think if you can, you know, that's another way that you can humanise yourself with people online just to set the scene and let them know that here are your tips. However, I'm not here to make your webinar a success overnight or anything like that and start to build rapport that way with people and be honest. And I think if you have been a participant on a webinar before or if you are presenting on a webinar but you've never been a participant then the best thing to do is to become a participant somehow. Go register. There are hundreds of free webinars online and put yourself in their shoes and listen to what other presenters are doing and then think, okay, how could I do this better on my webinar or oh, I think they should have said something different there or I think they could be rapport building here or there and try and use those little techniques as much as possible. Um, but yeah, just a few tips and like I said, if you um, engage people from the beginning through the registration process and get that feedback, that's another way for you to engage people and frame your content at the beginning. So a few little tips there and it does, you know, encompass a whole lot of the webinar planning stages um, and I'm going to in a moment put a link into the chat box which will actually have some information on the presenter centre um, which is a place where you can go to to watch these videos. But that pretty much wraps it up Michael. Um, I have a few more questions um, that I do want to actually get into from people out there but what I would like people to do and this is also another um, feature of the platform is to actually complete the survey on the right hand side. So we like to bring this up during the Q&A session at the end um, because it allows people to actually do something and still engage in something as well as um, 
typing out questions and listening to us. But as you know, as a presenter, make sure that you capture as much feedback from people as possible. Um, and you know, you can send people an email the next day asking for their feedback, but it's not going to be fresh in their mind. If you can get this feedback on the fly from people who are engaged in the webinar, then that's the exact feedback that you want. Um, and then learn from it, I guess. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Michael. Do you have anything that you would like to add before we go to the rest of the questions from everyone? Um, no, I just want to say from the very beginning, um, I saw that a lot of you uh, typed in that you haven't done presenting before, you've never presented before. So yeah, just take your time with it. Make sure you rehearse. The more that you rehearse and you're not caught off guard is the best advice that we can possibly give. And just constantly try different things. See what works for you. And yeah, as Sarah mentioned, we have a uh, an amazing site, webinars.com.au, which has a presenter center, which has all these different videos in it, which is absolutely great. So please... Uh, have a check out of that because trust me, you'll get a lot of information from there. And sorry, Ruth, there's um, one typo. Just tick any of those radio buttons at the last question of the form. Um, that question just didn't come through. Um, but I've just put a link into the presenter centre. Like I said, if you go to webinars.com.au, that will have so much information um, for you guys on webinars. So everything from presenting to marketing your webinar to previous webinars. So if you want to go on and have a look at some other webinars and how other people are presenting, feel free to go on there and take a look. Um, and I just want to also let you guys know that we will be sending out a recording within 48 hours um, and that will contain a link to today's webinar as well as the PowerPoint slides, some other links that we've spoken about today as well. But also on that will be our direct details. So if you have any questions at all regarding today, um, Megan, I will get back to you regarding facilitation after the webinar, um, but any other questions or any other tips or anything that you felt wasn't really explained today, um, please let us know. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to just finish up the last question that we have here from Shannon, um, and thanks everyone for joining. Now, Shannon, so is it possible to vet questions in the chat box? Um, and I'll hand this over to Michael. Well, yeah, there is. So there's a setting that you can put on so that people can tick a question icon so that it will show up, so that it highlights that it is a question. As a facilitator, you will be reading through the questions, and if you are trying to vet questions before they go to the facilitator, I would privatize it so that people aren't seeing the questions come through. We've made our chat box completely public, so everyone can see everything that gets chatted in there. really depends on your audience and everything, but if you want to have it privatized so not everyone's seeing it, that's a way of moderating questions before they go through, and then you can choose which ones to say. Alternatively, there is a QA manager functionality, which is an advanced feature of the function. Uh, of the platform that you can use to moderate questions. But for the chat box, the, the, yeah, the little question icon is key and I probably privatize it so people don't see. And then as a facilitator, you would choose which ones to read out. Excellent. Thank you for that. And hopefully that has, um, and definitely Shannon, with sensitive topics, um, it does really help. Um, and what you can also do as a facilitator, Shannon, I might add, I can actually go in here and I can actually highlight text. So I've just highlighted your question as yellow. So then Michael will be able to see that that's yellow and maybe that's of high importance for him. If you know, yep. that's the way that we can communicate without having to communicate verbally. So definitely something I would recommend is hopping in the platform, um, attending a training session with one of our trainers, which happen on a weekly basis. Um, and then also they can show you some other tips and tricks that you might also not know about. Um, and Ruth, so what level of analysis do you have on the feedback? So I think are you just referring to um, the survey that's up now or any sort of reporting that you can get from the system? Um, I think we'll, just, we'll talk about all of it actually because I think that is a good question. Well, with uh, the survey yep. here on the right hand side, you can create whatever questions you like in there Ruth and you create that pre pre-event um, because you don't want to be creating that on the fly, but you can have up to six questions. Um, you can have radio buttons, you can have drop downs, you can have open-ended questions, whatever you like. Um, all you need to do, I can send you a link if you like to step-by-step -step how to create the actual survey within the platform. Um, it's very, very simple and then all you need to do is activate it. But other reports that you can pull, Michael? Yeah, so the other reports are any functionality that you use during the day, you get absolutely all those reports afterwards and they can be downloaded from the administration portal that we have. If you do a managed service where you have a facilitator and someone, they'll actually package up all your reporting for you, which is a different thing. But what it is is that anyone that's answered any poll questions and done the survey, anything, it all gets downloadable, uh, downloaded as a CSV file. 
Um, and it's really easy to read. It's really comprehensive. It gives you a breakdown of all of it, and it's really quite a valuable tool. As Sarah said, on the surveys and polls, you can have multiple within the room, and each one of them is broken down individually for the reporting. So you don't just have to have one survey. We have a couple of clients that do it quite interesting. Well, they'll have a survey at the very beginning serving people on their level of knowledge going into the topic, and then they'll do the same coming out of it. So then they can compare both of them at the end, which is quite nice. And then, as I said before, it's all downloadable from the administration site if you're using it from our platform. And Ruth, just in terms of analysing the survey feedback, so there's a reports portal which you can go to and export all of this information. But um, in terms of how we analyse our data personally, so we obviously provide it to people afterwards, but then every quarter we go through, so we even go through our registration pages and we say, okay, we had 1,000 people look at this registration page and only 200 people registered, what can we do to fix that? We also then go through um, the survey feedback that we're actually all the data that we've exported and then we talked, we obviously give it to our presenters in raw format so they can do whatever they like with it. But what we also do is we go through and we, as you can see here, we've got a rating scale. So we've got excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. And what we actually do, we compare that to other webinars over time as well. So we can then see, you know, is the quality of our webinars increasing or is it decreasing? Um, and I think the best information for us is that qualitative feedback that we receive. So that question number three there, receiving that information um, and doing things with that information is really important to us. Um, what we will be doing in 2015 as an organisation um, is creating benchmarking. So obviously we run hundreds and hundreds of webinars on a monthly basis, uh, we'll be analysing all this data and then providing it to you all in a report. So as a customer, you can then say, yes, it can be exported to CSV, you can then say, okay, my webinars were run on this date, this date, this date, and my feedback was excellent, and I'm in this industry. As a benchmark, how does this relate to everyone else in my industry? So there's so far to go in the webinar world and we're only getting started which is really exciting but I think you know just getting involved in these little things and you know being willing to analyse your data and improve on what you're currently doing is the first step. Um, so yeah any sort of other ways that we can provide you with some more intelligence or any other things that you think as a customer oh this is what I would like to know this is how I think I could improve my webinars let us know and we will we will create it somehow, trust me. <laughs> well, I won't personally, I'll get the tech guys to do it. Um, but <laughs> that brings us to the end, guys. Um, thank you for staying on for so long. It's been a great session. Um, we've had a lot of fun. And yeah, feel free to give us a shout if you need anything else after the event. We'll close down the webinar for now. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you.